us have been so blessed since the next conference started on Saturday. Let me know. You don't sound like you're so excited. <laughs> Hallelujah. These people are so hungry. They don't want any introductions. We are blessed. Go forward. <laughs> Praise God. I'm definitely so excited to be here. I have been looking forward to the next conference, actually since 2020. Yeah, we were preparing, excited, looking forward just uh, before, you know, we had to go on the lockdown, I think. And so I carry that desire, that expectation, that longing for over a year. It's been almost 14 months of looking forward to what the Lord wants to do with us as a people as he prepares us to steal what his move and to steal what his revival, to steal what his desires, right? Um, in this generation, and if Christ, you know, uh, extends his coming, we get a chance to build an intergenerational, a transgenerational work for the Lord God Almighty. And so it's such a great, great, great uh, privilege to be here standing alongside my very beloved brother, Pastor Shalom Kodwa, his beloved wife, Lady T, and all the extraordinary voices and vessels of God's revival in this end time who are part of this conference. I feel like I've just been sandwiched amongst God's best. So it's going to rub off, right? Hallelujah. I want to take a moment to really celebrate um, the ministry gifts, the ministers of the gospel, pastors evangelists, teachers, prophets, apostles who are in this meeting, who are joined, who joined us online, and to also really specially celebrate all the pastors of King's Word everywhere. Do we want to honor and truly bless the Lord for his shepherds who bring God's word to us, who nurture us, who teach us? We honor you, we celebrate you. We are blessed to be raised by you. And we declare that your seed sown is blessed and the Lord increases your fruit of righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. God bless you for honoring them. Um, I thank God that Pastor Shola has said that going forward, or at least next year, the next conference is going to be camp meeting style. Because you see the, the tutelage of Zion, the instructions, the, the uh, learning plan, the diet the milling system in Zion is rigorous and is systematic, right? It's layer upon layer, it's precept upon precept, line upon line. So one of the things that I believe the Lord is injecting into the body, into the church in this hour is a very systematic um, procedural training of his people. There's a way that the army is trained. Hallelujah. And some of the challenges that we're faced with some of the irregularities and misconduct and deviations from the learning of Christ that we're faced with as a generation and a people is connected to poor tutelage, right? And the Lord has started to even say, look, some of the things you're seeing are just the evidence of the orphan spirit. And he said, I am visiting my body and I'm healing her of the orphan spirit. There are too many people who you know, came in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, received the life of God, got born again, but were not raised. They were not fathered. They were not mothered. They didn't, they didn't get into a family system and they did not, you know, come to learn of the Lord in a way that really grows them, in, that is in a way that is sound and solid and balanced, right? And so the Lord is doing that for us. He is restoring fathers to son. He is, he is establishing the solitary in families, right? He is grounding you in destiny. And, and so some of the things that are going to come through today are things you will still have to go back to on your own and sit with. That is the way that you can draw the juice. How many of you listen to some messages and you get it the seventh time? Right, And it's not because the Holy Spirit wasn't with you from the beginning, but it's because there's, there's just too much debris and residue and conditioning. So the first three times you're listening to it, you know, the Holy Spirit is just taking care of all the things in you that can make room, that can accommodate, you know, the, the word of God and the truth of the word of God. And then as, how, as this, that spring cleaning and 
there is now room, you start to understand, you start to decipher, you start to interpret accurately the word of truth. Let me run along today, uh, sharing with you what the Lord has put in my heart about a generation and what you must begin to pay keen attention to um, if you're going to steward God's purpose, if you're going to operate at the level of you know, productivity and elite divine performance that the Lord has for you. God is seeking a people, and I know that you might have heard that the 90th time listening to me, who can accomplish for him the greatest amount of impact in the shortest possible time. And that's the thing about the finishing generation. That's the thing about the end time army. And we are in the end of the end time. And so God is looking to build you up, to raise you so that you can stand as a part of this formidable army that can accomplish his work, that can get into Babylon and shop out our souls, right? Get our destinies. You know, I was almost quaking on my seat on Saturday when Pastor Shola said, I'm going to be teaching you about Babylon shops in Zion. I'm like, what? Because what he has said to me was, you know, talking about the prophetic requirements of this generation, he said, Zion has to engage Babylon. So when I heard that, ah, okay, I'm in the right place. And I hope that we get to that uh, very shortly. So I just want to share with you a few things about how God sees a generation and how you should begin to see this generation, your role in it. We run along to the prophetic requirements specific for this time. What are the things that God is asking us to pay keen attention to? And then we go on to uh, the operations of Babylon versus Zion. And I want to show you a few things about how Satan has become sophisticated uh, in a subtlety. And you've got to pay attention to how he's engaging today so that you can enforce the victory that you have in Christ Jesus. Are you interested to go on that journey? Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm going to be taking a strong teaching style, interjecting as the Spirit moves us on the rapids of the Holy Ghost and uh, forth telling, declaring, praying over you um, just in the course of the time that we have here together. But because it's quite a, you know, a few things that you know we've got to cover, I will be running along uh, in a strong teaching style. So what do we see? Psalm 22, 30 to 31, it says, A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. A seed shall serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto all people that shall be born that he had done this. A seed shall serve him, and it will be accounted unto the Lord for a generation. And scripture says in Acts 13, verse 36, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, he fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and he saw corruption. So basically, he had an allotment in time to serve the purpose of God, the agenda of God. And by the way, the agenda of God knows no gender. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. So, sisters, you listen with a, a different degree of attention because the Lord has said that it is the time for the future forward female. And there's a very unprecedented anointing that the Lord has actually released over the uh, female gender in this time, his daughters. It's, it's what is called almost like a uh, the daughters of Zelophi had moved. That's how we, that's the closest representation in scripture for what I discerned in my spirit occurring prophetically in this hour. It's the daughters of Zelophi had moved. The daughters of Zelophi had had to have a conversation with the prophet and they said, look, our father is late. He was a prophet that served diligently. He had no sons, but because of the customs of our time, his inheritance has been withheld from us. And it was such an unprecedented thing they did because women had never confronted the status quo before them. And so they showed up and they said, we've got an inheritance. We belong to the bloodline. We belong to the lineage, right? We are our father's uh, progenitor or we're our, we're our father's offspring. He's our progenitor. So, and we want what belongs to us rightfully because God's agenda knows no gender. 
And that's what the Lord said he's doing. And I'm taking this moment to declare over you every single daughter of destiny, every female man standing in the place of destiny. You're seated in this room. You're listening online. I'm asking for the power of the Holy Spirit to awaken a recognition of your divine identity. I declare in the name of Jesus that you are future forward. I declare that you are visionary. You have capacity to see the oppositions, the obstacles the labels, the societal pressures, the expectations and boxes that you've been put in both by society and the church establishment in his religious form. I'm asking that you break out in the name of Jesus. I declare you arise with a strong voice and you go forward. You advance significantly. You take the territories God has for you because you are a spirit endowed by the most high to do his bidding on the earth so be on the lookout throughout the next conference and in the days ahead there are mantles coming there are mantles coming i'm telling you be sensitive be present the lord is going to bypass those limitations and those boxes and those in those you know encumbrances and entanglements even those emotional uh you know brokenness and he is going to come for you empower and anoint you so that you can take him to your generation in the name of jesus and so he said, a seed shall serve him and he shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. And the scripture in Acts 13, 36 talked about David serving his own generation by the will of God. And the first thing I believe the Lord wants to alert you to about a generation is that whenever God finds a seed, he has found a generation. One man who allows himself to be a seed in his generation sown by the Lord will bring a great harvest to him. And what this means is that when God is thinking about a generation, it's in a prophetic context. And what that means is he's not looking at the mass population and saying in this generation, within this age bracket, these are the total number of people they know. When God is directing his own holy intentions and his agenda specific to a dispensation, God is in search for men in that generation that can carry his purpose. When he finds them, God can reach that generation. So God doesn't reach a generation by reaching a generation. God reaches a generation by reaching a seed. Hallelujah. A seed will serve him. It will be accounted unto the Lord for a generation. So when God sets out to accomplish the next phase of his eternal plan that stretches from the beginning until the end of time and continues in an endless vast eternity. Now let me break it down a little bit. God has an eternal plan. Is that correct? God has a kingdom that is established in the heavens and that he wants to establish on the earth. Hallelujah. God has an agenda, a purpose, an intention, a holy plan so that every knee will bow to the Lord Jesus and all peoples of all tribes and all languages and all races will be sold out completely to the kingdom of God Almighty. Hallelujah. But you see, the eternal plan of God is too enormous. It is too massive to be shrunk into the limitations of time. Right? However, in every generation, so what the Lord does is he takes a portion of that eternal agenda and he locks it into a dispensation. Do you understand this? So you might be seeing what God is doing in your time. And it feels like all that God is doing. But you are just on a button pass. The thing has been on long before your father's father's father conceived your father's father's father. Something like that. Do you understand this? So the eternal purpose of God is allocated to dispensations meaning that and i'm going to come to that 
Meaning that every generation gets a portion of the work that God is doing on the earth realm. Is that correct? Every generation gets a portion of this ongoing divine agenda of God for the earth. So that his purposes, his will, his kingdom is established on the earth just as it is in the heavens. And so you've got to understand that even though God is the same, he is the same, Jesus is the same, yesterday, today, and forever, God's purposes has been broken down and we have an allotment, our own part to play today in this time. And so there are things that were not highlighted for the previous generation that is important today. And it's important, we will find that we now need to really focus on what God is focusing on. And that's why I'm going to really try to run along and get on into what the Lord has shown uh, as prophetic requirements for this generation what we must pay attention to, and what we must focus on getting done if we're going to be able to accomplish our portion of the work. Our work is cut out for us. Find a sister or a brother and say, our work is cut out for us. So when God reaches a seed, when he finds a seed, God can reach a generation. His attempt is not to reach a generation, you know, every single person. He wants to reach everyone, but he goes through men. Those who are willing to embody his purpose um, in their time. And in Psalm 23, you see how the psalmist begins to declare, talking about the kind of man that can steward the move of God, that can come to his holy hill, and he started to say, who can ascend to the hill of God? Who can stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And if you've been part of the Firebrand Foreigner Bible School, you will understand Psalm 24 as the curriculum for foreigners. It's a curriculum for any saint who wants to carry out a walk with God on the earth. And so he talks about this man, describes this man who can walk with God, who can ascend to the hill of God. And then he comes to, I think uh, maybe it's verse 6, I'm not certain, but he says, This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. He's describing a man, and then he is talking about a generation. You might look at what is going on around us and feel like, how long is it going to take us before we can really make a dent in nation building? But I'm telling you that the methodology of God is man. Man is the methodology of God. If he finds a seed and God can pour himself through that man, a generation will be reached. And there are vacancies in the spirit you can be a part of this thing that God is doing today. So look at that. When God wants to reach a generation, he reaches a man. He reaches a man. Ezekiel 22 from 23 says, And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained on in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion, tearing the prey. They have devoured my people. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in their midst. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They've not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the clean and the unclean. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so I am profaned amongst them. Right? Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy the people, to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plaster themselves with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them saying, Thus says the Lord, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and the needy, and have wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who 
could make a wall and stand in the gap before me uh, on the behalf of the land uh, so that I should not destroy it. But I found none. God wanted, and I'm going to tell you something that is a little scary, or it was scary to me when he said it. The Lord had woken me um, in a night vision, and he said to go to this scripture. He said, I want to show you a replica of your generation in scripture. And I came to this scripture. I was so terrified. Like, how would God even say this about my generation? But look around you. Don't fixate on church, our seminars, our conferences, our Bible schools, our nice events, the Christianists that we speak. Look around you. How come there is so much rot and you're present in this time? Read it carefully. You see us. You see us as a people. But the hope, the, the beautiful thing that you find in the scripture is that the Lord said, these guys have done so much evil. They have been profiting from prophet lying. They have committed robberies. Their kings, their presidents and governors have been wolves tearing down the people like prey. It's been bloody on the streets. There have been no compassion or kindness there is, village life has ceased, to use the words of one of my matrix, right? Village life has ceased. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. There's no peace. But he said, I sought a man. I sought a man that could stand in the gap. And I know that phrase is one of the most theologically damaged phrases in, the, in, in all of scriptures closely after repent standing the gap is intercession intercession is not only praying in fact praying is the lowest on the cadre of prophetic intercession praying is meant to be feel for a system of action that engages society and turns the Lord back from his wrath Hallelujah. You don't drive in your fancy cars and say you are in intercession where you can't even be part of a feeding program in your community. Have you ever been to Isaiah 58? That's intercession. That's the kind of fast that he approves. And these are the signs that show us that God is desperately in search for a man. Male man, female man, a seed that can serve him. Don't be distracted by the technology of our tongues and how we fall down and break chairs. Don't be moved by the sound of our choir. Don't be fascinated by how our teachers preach up a stump. When God is in search of a man that can reach a generation, Look at a place like Ezekiel 22. To reach a generation is to end these things, this, this, this pain in the land. To elevate the quality of life for those who desperately need it. So this, these things are just strengthening for us. The understanding that God's intention for a people is usually expressed when he finds seeds on the earth that he can pour himself into. And there's got to be a longing in your heart that you are going to become as Christ to your generation. And I'm not talking about being anointed. I'm talking about being consecrated. I'm not talking about your gifts. I'm talking about your fruit. I'm talking about what Christ is producing out of you. You see, because the anointing can empower you to serve assignments. And that is great. And we've taught that for a while, right? But when it comes to being a man that God can perpetuate himself through in a generation, it's about who you are in the spirit. 
It's about who you are in the spirit. It's about that Psalm 24 guy. People get anointed, you know, and that's what Pastor Shola was talking about on Saturday. The anointing upon versus the anointing within. And many of us don't get too excited about the anointing within because it's the darker places of growth. It's not obvious. It's, it's where the Holy Spirit does the hard lifting. It's the place of becoming. It's the place where you are dying daily. And it's uncomfortable. It's painful. Right? The anointing upon, it empowers you to get something done. But reaching a generation, it's not just about getting something done. It's about being present in Babylon as Christ. At the level of going into the mountains where you are confronted with occultism, Satan must not find a thing of himself in you. Hallelujah. That's, that's the anointing within. That's refiner's fire. That is all of Christ, not half Christ, half man. And that's why our impact is not far-reaching. Because we're just having this project-based experience with God. Let me start something to anoint me. And because he still needs to reach his people, he says, okay, let's get this done. But if a seed will serve him and it will be accounted unto him for a generation, it's becoming Christ. Let me say this to you. You cannot serve your generation without serving God's purpose in that generation. And that seems like a really simplistic statement, isn't it? Yeah, of course, of course. But what the Lord is alerting us to, and we see that in the life of David and this very powerful scripture in Acts 13 verse 36. What the Lord is alerting us to is because there is the rise of the spirit of man, and I hope I can get to it uh, in a short time. There's the rise of the spirit of man in our generation. Many people are stewarding self-fabricated ambition that has the branding of God on it. It's your thing. You know, in the depths of your, hum in your, in the depths of your being, say, now you get on. Right, but it's nicely branded. It looks like kingdom, sounds like kingdom, but it's not kingdom. It's just using Christ for celebrity status. Hallelujah. Is that rain? Ooh, who can hear the sound of an abundance of rain? Hallelujah. So if we are going to reach our generation for God, we've got to be stewarding God's own plans and God's own purpose, God's own agenda. The thing about the agenda of God is it doesn't always put us in the front line. Can we damage this front line Christianity for a moment? Can we talk about those who are going to be at the back end of nowhere without Instagram accounts and a thousand, hundreds of thousands of followers, but who will be generals ensuring that the mandate of heaven is executed with precision and speed on the face of the earth? Can we talk about that for a moment? So if we are going to reach our generation... If God is going to reach this generation, he will reach this generation through us. Say amen to that. Amen. And if he's going to reach this generation through you, you've got to have nothing but what he puts on you. You've got to have not, no fallback plan, nothing but what he puts in you. And that assignment may not be fancy. Hallelujah. If you ever understand kingdom order, you are going to be such a blessed 
vessel in the kingdom. Kingdom order is not vertical hierarchy. Kingdom order is army hierarchy. Army hierarchy is not merely vertical. Army hierarchy is multidimensional. What that means is that all that makes up the army is not just the general, the colonel, the captain, the platoon leader, and the platoon. Even in the platoon, people must be positioned strategically if the entire strategy of the army will work. Do you understand this? If the guy who is meant to be on defense is not standing in his place, the guy who is going on, on the offensive may not be able to accomplish the agenda of the, of the military. So the reason everybody is clamoring for the front line is because you think that to be a leader means to be vertically in hierarchy, having people you are above. In kingdom, you can be to the left, another general to the right. Hallelujah. Forget the movement of my hands. Just take it as prophecy. <laughs> right? You can be positioned diagonally to the left, to the right. Diagonally to the, to the left because each placement is critical for the fullness of the strategy to work. And so if you're pastoring a church of 500,000 people and somebody is a missionary in the north or in a nameless little village in the east, you're not higher than them. You're not better than them. There are things you need from them that you don't have. There are things they need from you that you don't have. And this competitive, demonic influx that has invaded the church quietly, where even between ministers, there are levels day. How did we get here? Why? Unresolved carnality. Because the enemy goes, the enemy, and I, I want to run along so we could get there. The enemy goes for your unresolved carnality. He goes for the areas where you are uncircumcised. So if Jesus, if you don't let Christ be formed in you, when the anointing comes upon you, you just become an anointed carnal man who is still limping or who is still walking in the places where your joints should be taken away. You are too full, you are too whole, you are too wise, you are too okay. You don't have need to depend upon because you are still fully man. Just an anointed version of a man who is fully man. So you make those calculations. They tell you, have you heard about someone? You quickly go to the Instagram page. 11,000 followers, you're not doing much yet. Right? Someone says, God put a, a, a letter for the church in my heart and it's documented in a book. You look at the front cover, you know that if your graphic guy handles that kind of front cover, what will come out? So the thing is looking funny, the prints, it's looking like photocopy on the inside. You don't even read it. You just like, it is well. <laughs> because you know where you are printing from Destiny House, USA. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And when you see these things in yourself, it should make you shudder. It means we won't let get it. When you see carnality, mm -hmm. you should shudder. You should stay there. You should take it to Christ. And you should submit to the discipline that come to only sons. This one that you eat anytime and sleep anytime and speak anyhow and do anything and cut off from any relationship. You are your own man. One of the clearest signs of Christ being formed in you is there are restraints placed on you against your will. It is swimming against the tides, literally, literally. It's a climb uphill. 
You know something is happening on you. It's uncomfortable. If your Christianity is not uncomfortable, you are not a seed yet. Because every seed that is going to impact a generation must fall down and die or else it abides alone. If Trinity is going to come alongside you, you can't abide alone. You can't abide alone. So he said, look at the things that I'm seeing in this generation. And I'm searching for a man. He wants to fix a generation, heal a generation, forgive the grievances he has against a generation. And he's seeking for a man, a man. It's the intelligence of Trinity. Because they are unfazed by the oppositions of darkness. They just need a man to pour themselves into. So if you want to serve your generation, you've got to serve God's purpose. God's purpose. God's purpose. And God's purpose is in the, the discovery of God's purpose is an evolutionary state. He didn't show you everything as at once. So this bio that you have and is already fixed because a branding expert told you you have to be known for something is problematic. You don't even know where you're going because you are going where God is going. Something, something expert. I come in peace. Look at that. I want to say this to you. I believe that it is such um, a defining insight as we explore how to release the destiny of our generation. The destiny of a, of a generation is proportional to the consecration of its forerunners. The destiny of any generation is proportional to the consecration of its forerunners. The degree to which a generation fulfills its own allotment of the divine plan is proportional to the consecration, the workings of Christ, the taking of the cross and following Jesus Christ daily that is exhibited by the seeds of God in that generation. And so it's not, it has never been and will never be about the number of churches or the number of ministries or the number of Christians. If our generation is going to rise and release this revival that is, is so impending, is so imminent, the clouds are full, they want to rain. If the things in the heart of God, if the takeover mission in the Father's heart and the widespread release of his power, of his person, of his purity, his purpose, if it's going to be unleashed on a people, it is proportional to the degree of the consecration of its forerunners, those who say yes to God. Thank you, Father. Shabalados, let's bring the spirit a bit. Makros attached to Blegadusa. Blarabahas and Grarosi tesh to Frega delegados. Makabalagadabahash and Bradosa Tarabahande. Levredus e gross mesho tokoto pelegadebaha. Manda baruse clo bragadas tananas e gross et habaladabaha. Meko jadaza dila gados et trega delegados la badiso candele berusa. We are going to be counted as seats for the Lord in our time. Malados and gradaba sheta le frega de jobeluzu dush and graba dagabaha. Hallelujah. Number five generations are not 
counted in time. They are counted in men. So a generation is not defined by time. If you look at uh, Matthew chapter 1, when Brother Matthew was making uh, a chronology of Adam unto Christ, he split it into three dispensations of 14 generations each. Hallelujah. From Abraham to David, 14 generations. From David to the captivity of the children of Israel into Babylon, 14 generations. On to, just go to the end of Matthew. And then from the captivity onto Christ, 14 generations. And you would imagine that if these are these dispensations or these uh, timelines at each 14 generations, they would be accomplished in around the same time, right? Around the same number of years if a generation is a specific amount of time. Does that make sense to you? So if a generation and, you know, uh, a Christian science sort of says that a generation is about 50 years, 40 to 50 years, a generation. Right? So if a generation is a specific amount of years that we are in the same generation, for example, this generation started at this time and will end at this time, it will mean that each 14 generations should be multiplied by just a certain number of years. Is that correct? But it doesn't play out that way. Even in Luke's rendition, it doesn't play out that way because generations are not counted in time. Generations are counted in men. Abraham to David was 911 years. David to the captivity was 497 years. The captivity to Christ was 591 years. Right? Just a bit of historical mathematics. There might be variations in uh, a few years or months, but that's just to show you that it's not in the timing, it's in what was accomplished by the men in those generations. A generation is, is, uh, comes to completion in the heart of God when the purposes of God for that dispensation is accomplished. Hallelujah. So a generation is not merely a specific duration of time. It's a transitionary interface between the timing of divine manifestation from one lineage to another. It's the, it's the interface between when a dispensation completed its portion of the work and when the next completed their portion of the work, that's a generation. And if we're not even schooled about what the Lord did with those who went ahead of us, with the fathers before us, how are we going to excellently steward what God has put on our own generation? Hallelujah. Let me take you um, to the, and I'm just going to, uh, you know, mention them to you. We might not be able to go in depth into them, but seven things that the Lord is asking us to pay keen attention to. The prophetic requirements of our generation. The things that we must do if we're going to fulfill the purposes in the Lord's heart. If we're going to accomplish his agenda for this time. The first is the rebuilding of the rooms. They are broken bridges and broken walls. The rebuilding of the ruins, the burden in the father's heart is a great one. The burden in the father's heart is a great one. If we, one of the best ways to walk with the Lord is for your heart to be moved by what moves his heart. For your heart to be broken by what breaks his heart. And I declare in the name of Jesus that that is the people who are listening today. That your, your heart will begin to burn for what touches the Father's heart. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you will have no ambitions of your own. But you will be stead with desire for the Lord's desire. He says it's time to rebuild the ruins. The ruins of the people. The ruins of the nations. 
If the Lord has called you with a healing anointing, if the Lord has called you, you know, um, to heal the brokenhearted, to strengthen those who mourn, to bring joy to those in depression, know that your work is cut out for you. But you don't, you don't face depression and mental issues by merely getting a certification. That's not how you attack the oppression of Satan. Hallelujah. You don't just become a counselor and a depression coach or a depression recovery expert. I come in peace. You've got to be Christ. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? Hallelujah. It's a question about identity. Who are you? In the spirit, what do you wear? What do you carry? Where have you been? How are you endued? Who are you? That's a question of the anointing within, not the anointing upon. Some of you, you know, in the Lord's mercy, he is just sort of shielding you from the things that will rock you to your foundation about whether you are called or not. And in the days ahead, the enemy is going to get more on the offensive. Rebuilding the ruins, the people, the nations, the heart of the Lord is burning for these things. Number two, stewarding ancient mantles. There are so many mantles, right, that are existing in real estates in the spirit. They are for the earth, and heaven has no need for what is for the earth. Hallelujah. And you know the reason we need mantles? In the finishing generation, in the completion hour, the final hour, we need not just anointings, we need mantles. Because mantles, mantles have become spiritual infrastructure that is now that has understanding about the territories of men mantles are operations of god in men that he anoints and ordains generation to generation so when you are operating a mantle you are not just interacting with how you're gifted and how you're anointed and what God has done with you. You are interacting with a holy backlog of divine operations that have been passed on and perpetuated before you, passed on to you. Do you understand this? So you get to an arena, there's demonic activity. And because this mantle you are wearing has operated in a father before you who you know who has seen demonic operation so that that divine operation that divine working of the life of god snows territories you get to that arena by experience is strange to you but it's not strange to the mantle because it has seen it in the father and the father's father who embodied it before you and so if we are going to have actualization, divine actualization that is, that is rapid, that covers ground in a short time, we need mantles. And I think that one of the most worrisome things, please I celebrate Reverend K, Dr. K. Good to have you, sir. Good morning. Amen, amen. One of the worrisome things about how the church is interacting with mantles is we think it is only for ministry and we think that it is only on men of God. Mantles are divine operation. 
divine operations, the workings of the life and the spirit of God that has been embodied by forerunners who went before us interacting with territories and realms and mountains. So there are mantles for fashion, mantles for healthcare, mantles for IT, mantles for education, not just for ministry. So there are forerunners. There could be a forerunner in agriculture somewhere in Zimbabwe who is making a transition because one of the things the Lord has shown us about the next three years is there is a prophetic window for transitions. Many fathers are transiting in the next three years. They're either transiting their natural sphere because they've been called home to the Lord. They could be transitioning because the Lord has called them to a higher place in terms of an assignment, a mandate, or the next phase of their work. Right? And the mantle they occupy, because mantles sit on offices, not people. And the mantles they occupied could be released to sons in training because as they are fathers in transitions, they are sons in training and fathers in training. Hallelujah. And then those transitions could occur sadly because his presbytery another had to take. Because we're going to be witnessing in the church, sadly, exposures coming by the light of God as he visits his people. Secret sins that have been kept over the years covered right while ministry was still thriving those who became wolves taking advantage of the gullible and the vulnerable sitting with uncircumcision and unresolved carnality the time has come and says the lord and now is they were going to be seeing light shining through those dark places and that is a kind of transition as well. And I'm praying and believing and releasing my faith and interceding in prayer for the body that the Lord will begin to, that the sons will begin to respond to the Lord as he's highlighting areas of unresolved carnality, places where sin still abounds. And he's going to lead them on a journey of restoration in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do a better amen. So he said it's a requirement for a generation. We've got to learn to desire, receive, steward ancient mantles because we have a need for compounded graces. Who knows about compound interest? Who knows about compound interest? Yeah, that kind of grace, compounded. Seizing after seizing, forerunner after forerunner, it has now become concentrated, OT key. So it gets great results in a short amount of time. Number three, restoring the ancient landmarks and ordinances, the things that count to God still count to God. God didn't get funkier with every generation. He's not shifting grounds on holiness. He's not shifting grounds on honor. He's not shifting grounds on submission. He's not shifting grounds on, you know, giving, covenant relationships. He's not shifting grounds on the discipline and the discipleship that makes sons. And if we're asking why we're not seeing his move like we saw before, then let's, let's be willing to go back to the ordinances. There are ordinances of revival. Ordinances of consecration. There are things that birth the move of God in a time amongst the people. He's not backing down on those. Can someone say amen to that? 
Number four, and I already sort of mentioned this, Zion has to go to Babylon. Zion has to go to Babylon because contact is possible without contamination. We've got to begin to engage the culture. The church is not meant to be a sitting house. It's meant to be a sending house. And this is going to be important if we're going to carry the weighty moves of God and see his work. And you see, one of the big reasons why we can't escape going to Babylon, maybe what needs to happen is to begin to teach the protocol of being a saint in a dark world, right? How to engage. The reason you can't escape it is the now move of God has left the church. And that does not mean that God is not in the church or with his people. But God, when he comes upon you, he moves you. He wants you to go do something with what you got on Sunday all through the rest of the week. And so there will now be pastors in entertainment, apostles in technology, evangelists in education, teachers in medicine. Do you understand this? And so if you are going to go out there and be a voice for God in media, you've got to stop being afraid. And we've got to stop believing this report that comes back saying, the moment they go there, they are lost in the world. Do you know who is on your inside? But the truth is, if we don't become Christ, the darkness in the world is dark enough to sway. Number five, fully becoming Christ. Understanding the architectures of consecration. Because Christ is the seed. And the only way that God can automate his purpose in a generation is through the sequence of growth called Christ. A seed is a sequence of growth with a predictable outcome. Is that correct? Is that correct? Hallelujah. So if you, sow, if you put an orange in the soil, you're not expecting a mango. The only way that God can assure the harvest that he desires in the end time the world is ripe. The fields are ripe and God is seeking co-laborers. The only way that Christ can assure the harvest of what you're going to produce as a man in purpose, whether you've been sent to, you know, any arena of influence, whether it's ministry or business or in government or a faith-based nonprofit, wherever you go. And please, the next time you're sensing a call, don't think it's just uh, about starting a ministry. Because what has happened with the last generation is the call of God was, was interpreted based on the prevailing culture of the church at that time. And so there's still that carryover. The moment you begin to sense God calling you to do something, calling you onto himself so he can send you to do something because we're not called to do. We're called to Christ and then sent to do. And then the moment we begin to pick that calling, you are immediately thinking about, you know, Zion of God ministries. And before Jesus can even say, hey, wait, let me explain further, you're gone. You've created the logo. You've held your first meeting. Your father in the Lord has commissioned you. Off you go. And all the while Jesus is just like, ah, ah, what, ah, ah, what's going on? <laughs> Hallelujah. And you know, whatever we start, we have to sustain. I don't want to fund my life. I have no intention. But if it's not his will, it's not his bill. And that's why we get into naughty places. I have no intention of funding my life. I came on assignment. So fully becoming Christ. Christ is the seed that automates a harvest. If it's not Christ, it can't produce Christ. If it's not Christ, it can't produce Christ. 
Hallelujah. And so you can't merely think about what you are doing and what people think about what you're doing. You've got to think about who you are becoming and what God thinks about who you are becoming. And he's saying this is so important. Number six, he said it's time for fathers and sons to be reunited and the, the orphan spirit has to be banished. I'm walking with the time Pastor Shola gave me, but I've seen a different time. So I don't mind a handwritten version that tells me where I am right now and when I should round up. Pastor Shola's timing is so different. Um, and it's the one that I prefer. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's take it together again. Say with me, number one, rebuilding the rooms. The people rooms and the nation rooms. I want to spend a moment to, to, to say this. Some of you are being sent specifically to nurture back those who have been damaged by the failures of those set over us in the church as an institution. You might even have carried church wounds before the Lord, reached for you, helped you, healed you, and raised you, and you keep picking that burden. Let me tell you, do not allow any degree of righteous indignation that the enemy can easily hijack and convert to anger happen in your heart. The anger of men can never fulfill the righteousness of God. That is such an assignment that I sense and is so vivid in my spirit about this time we're in. There are those that God is sending with a strong healing anointing. And the healing anointing is revealed in compassion. Every time that Jesus had compassion on the people, he was moved. And the anointing of healing was released. If you're called this way, I want you to begin to spend time asking for the Lord to enlarge your heart. Because there's so many wounded soldiers. And if you see bitterness and resentment and dishonor, know that many times the root is these wounds that have not been dealt with. And even if you don't feel that assignment or that calling, can we as a people in the name of Jesus, those who are a part of the body of Christ, make new commitments to embody love? There's so much meanness in the church. There's so many unkind, judgmental people. There are so many medical diagnostic equipments in church. They look at people and they see all that is not well about them. And they prophetically draw conclusions. Right? There's too much naming and shaming and labeling and, you know, cliques and, you know, just different factions and corners. And you don't even sometimes want to hear what ministers are saying about themselves. That's, that for me is the one that baffles me the most. Why? Again, when you see these things, you should... Who was listening? When you see these things, you should... You should shudder. You should quake and tremble and go to the Lord and say, What forgets me? Because if he finds something of himself in you, that's not going to be you in the name of Jesus. So number one, rebuilding the ruins. Number two, stewarding ancient mantles. Number three, restoring the landmarks and the ordinances of God as of old. Number four, Zion has to go to Babylon because there can be contact without Number six, fathers and sons have to be reunited. And the thing I'd love to say on that as I go to my final uh, thoughts for you today is that sons have a responsibility to draw near unto fathers. Hallelujah. I know what has been, you know... Um, maybe culturally modeled is that if fathers, okay, maybe not even culturally, but I know that young people believe or think sometimes that if they don't come after, uh, if the fathers don't come after them, they didn't call me, you know, nobody reached out to me, 
that we will estrange ourselves. Don't estrange yourself. God is awakening the hearts of the fathers. They come in in the direction of their sons. But sometimes, they don't even know how to navigate your space. They don't know where to find you. Amen. They don't know how they will be received. Because fathers, even though they're elders, they have their vulnerabilities. And so if we're going to respond to the cleansing work of the Spirit of God, healing the church of the orphan spirit, healing our generation of the orphan spirit, we need to open up our hearts more. We need to forgive if forgiveness is needed. And then the most powerful way that the line is, the, the distance is cut short is by praying from the heart for the fathers. Thank you. Okay, not bad. Amen. And then number seven, raise not just the next generation, but the next in our generation. Hallelujah. A, a generation is a dispensation that has multiple, many timelines within it. And so the reason, and you need to listen to this, that sometimes we don't step out and do more for our generation is to feel everybody is okay. Let me go for the younger. We're going both for the younger and for those who might be contemporaries by age, but who can be picked up by grace. And on the flip, what that says is, please don't make the mistake of using social, social demographics and age to determine who God is raising over you to unlock destiny in the next season of your life. Don't do that. I'm even older than him. Don't do that. Be sensitive because God is housing the curriculum, the teaching system in Zion in men. God houses divine intelligence in men. And if you're going to benefit from that systematic, rigorous discipleship that grows you and unlocks the anointing on your inside, you've got to understand that there are people in your time, in your dispensation, in your generation, who might be contemporaries by age, but God has raised to raise you. I'm going to spend the remaining minutes of my time today running you through... Um, the operations of Zion versus Babylon, it may be what we will sit with when we get a chance at next 2022. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. How many of you have been blessed today? I have been richly blessed. And we will take back some of the things the Lord has shown us. Sit with it and trust him to open the eyes of your heart. Zion is a place of worship Babylon is also a place of worship. Zion is a place of worship and God is the one to be worshipped. And God is upfront about the object of your worship as far as Zion is, con is concerned. Scripture says in uh, Exodus 23, you must have no other God but me. No other God beside me. You must not have any other God before me. Hallelujah. Because in Zion, God is upfront that I'm the only object of your worship. The focus must be on me. Right? In Hebrews 12, 22, he said, we've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And he started to talk about what we've come to. We've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. We've come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. We've come to the spirit of just men made perfect. It's clear that God in Zion is the judge of all. It's clear. 
Babylon is a place of worship, but Satan is not up front because he, hide, he has something to hide. He's the father of lies. So the thing about Babylon is Satan is subtle. He's subtle. He's not trying for you to know that this is Babylon and the requirement is your soul. God is up front because the worship of God does you good. Satan isn't because the worship of Satan damages your soul and steals your destiny in Christ. So he hides. I want to talk to you about the specific operations of Babylon in our time because Babylon's operation continues to change from generation to generation. The, the, the model of Babylon is the utility of what is called familial intelligence. Meaning that Satan grows with every generation, keenly observing in a data-driven manner what are the unresolved consecrations and the uncircumcisions, the failings and the failures of its consecrated anointed forerunners. Carefully observes the desires, the agitations of its people because of the changes in technology and media and everything. He observes their music and their fashion and their interests. He observes even the success matrix of their ministries. Because he knows if it doesn't matter to you, he can't get you to worship on that thing. So it's, it's familial intelligence. He carefully observes, keenly, keenly following through your time series. Consistent analysis of where you are, who you are as a people, what you love, what moves you. So when he sees a man of God who sees a car and his body is shaking, German machine, ayabalagadaba. He doesn't mind that you put a tongue on that desire that you have not curbed. He's coming for it. You go to minister somewhere, media on flick, all of a sudden resentment begins to grow in your heart against your people. Won't they give? I don't know. This, uh, I don't know. I'm missing something. You get to church, it's almost looking like a curse. As you are speaking to them, there are some of you, I don't know what to say. He knows. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what is stressing you out. Right? He knows your unresolved pride that makes you set up the infrastructure of your ministry in a way that shows I'm better than you. Forget, so even though we are doing ministry together, I'm still your senior. He knows. He knows your fears as a woman because you saw what your father did to your mother. He knows. He's coming for that. He will use it to weaken submission because you have this fear that if you're vulnerable with a man, he's going to make you foot mat. He knows. That's Babylon. So Babylon's methodology has to change from generation to generation so that it can remain subtle. The power of Satan's methodology is the sophistication of its subtlety. He says sophisticated in the way that a believer can be tricked and think it will look and sound so good. You have to be Christ on the inside. And that's the whole thing about who you are versus who you are wearing. I don't just want to be anointed. I want to be as Christ. Every inch, every fiber in my spirit, blood bought, blood soaked, completely yielded. That's my desire. That's my desperation. Subaru Sindala Kosh. Okay. Oh, thank you, sir. Let me run through it, right? When we see in 2022, no, don't worry. Before 2022, uh, you would have it in a book. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's just put it in a book, right? Um, but what you should do is to ensure you get firebrand forerunners. I don't think I've ever spoken about any of my books, but it was very clear to me that that's a curriculum you have to explore. If some of these things, if they were sounding like this, ah, this thing, you know, it would help you get it. 
Anyone who has read Firebrand Forerunners? Oh, glory to God. So you should get it. I believe it's, it's out here. It's going to really be a blessing and it's going to uncover some of these uh, insights more. So he's sustaining the subtlety, the trickery. For a thing to be subtle is for it to be under the radar. Right? It can be missed. And that's the power of his methodology. I'm just going to read out this seven, uh, ten operations um, and trust the Lord that as you sit with it, he will guide and instruct your heart in Jesus. Number one, lost the worship of pleasure. The enemy is using this very strongly in this generation. And lust is not just about sexual pleasure. It's about sensual pleasure. That which pleasures your soul. The Netflix addiction. Hallelujah. Number two, materialism or mammon, the worship of money and things. And the reason this is a really powerful Babylonian operation today is that the church unconsciously has fueled the worship of money. One of the, un one of the most unhealthy doctrines that seeped into the church is the pursuit of God so that he can bless you. Hey, the pursuit of God so that he can bless you and the understanding of the blessing as a material manifestation is problematic so when you look at your life in numbers when it gets inside you can't look at your life in numbers and we do it from the stage unconsciously we talk in numbers so the other saints sitting there without a bank account in that number feel less blessed. That's not the purpose of God. The worship of money and things is a strong Babylonian operation in our time. And that is why when people step into a first phase of financial prosperity, they've not been schooled about the purpose of kingdom wealth don't know what to do with it. And so they spend it on that, that lust. They spend it on that mammon. They change their cars, move to a gated estate, overhaul their wardrobe, get themselves a stylist, if they are female, buy bone straight, <laughs> till their soul is bone dry. And when a real demand comes for that prosperity, they won't even know it because they were not taught. So they will continue to drive past children beggars. Whereas that prosperity was to be channeled as social saviors on that social matter. They will be dropping 100 naira and they will feel okay. It's a subtlety of the operation of Babylon. Number three, hustle, the worship of work and intellectualism. Unless the Lord builds a house. The labor in vain who build it. So hustle. They will hurry out of God's presence so they can go and do God's work. Please explain it to me. They will hurry out of the Lord's presence so, so they can get stuff done. They are going to be unable to focus on your way and exalt him in their heart till it's their complete consumption. Because the ticking time bomb in their minds reminding them of deliverables and proposals and social media postings so that they can keep up with the strategy that their coach gave them to hit their revenue goal. How did we get here? They will pride themselves in having less sleep, getting a lot done, operating a light productivity. They will show off with what they can accomplish by themselves. Whereas the model had always been spend the more time with God, get the bigger results in the world. What can intellectualism? They will intellectually massage 
the mental infrastructure of their church members. They would not articulate the stirrings of the spirit and the now intentions of the Godhead. But they will repeat that which they have read in self-help books that sound fascinating. They will be brilliant. They will use Harvard Business Review case studies and master classes in church. We have not covered the curriculum of revival, but we're having career master classes. I come in peace. Number four, approval addiction. The worship of men. The desire to be seen, to be liked, to be approved of. And social media will power that. They will do everything to be seen as valuable. They will do everything to be seen as progressive. They will be under pressure to showcase the blessings of God because they don't understand its purpose and they have unresolved insecurity using God for their celebrity status. Their agitations will continue. John 12, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that it would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise than the praise of God. Galatians 1.10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I'm not a servant of God. Number six, deception, the worship of our own truth. Deception is not merely the worship of untruth. It is the worship of our own truth. How many of you have started to hear, let, let, let express your truth. You don't have a truth. Truth is an absolute divine currency. It belongs to God. You are lying or you get out. Let, everybody has a right to share their own truth. Wait, what happened? You don't have a truth. The church is the ground and the pillar of truth. Jesus is the truth, the way, the life. Truth is an absolute SI unit. It's a divine currency that was before you came. You don't own a truth. If you have a truth, you are in deception. To own a truth is to self-fabricate an ideology based on experience, popular opinion, or private revelation. Even the prophecies of scripture are not a private re revelation, not a private interpretation. My own truth. You've got no truth. If you've got truth, you've got to discard it and step into the truth because it is the truth of God that will set you free. Hallelujah. And number seven, the spirit of man, the worship of self. The worship of self. The esteeming of self. Number eight, fear. The worship of Satan's report. You turn on the news, that's all that is there. Because the enemy is, is subtly invading the, the, the faith structures in the heart of the believer. Jesus said, Peter, Peter, the enemy has sought to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith will not fail when you are converted, strengthening the brethren. That's all is after, a failing faith. And your faith is a belief system. Fear is a belief system. And that's why scripture says, don't call controversy what they call controversy. Don't call fear what they call fear. You've got to have a definition for COVID-19 that you didn't learn from CNN. Number nine, witchcraft, the worship of demons. This is all going on. I'm going to tell you a thing about demonic activity. On the spectrum of carnality, at the end of it is demonic activity. What that means is you might not start out intending to have demonic operations invade your life and your space. But if you don't grow your spirit 
and continue to feed your flesh, that little exaggeration is waiting to become deception. That anger is waiting to become rage. That talkativeness is waiting to become an unconsecrated tongue that has strong, strong open doors for the works of darkness. Number 10, rebellion, the worship of rage. We saw this during the NSAS. Rebellion, the worship of rage. Anytime you find yourself actively rebelling in your heart, feeling like there is, there is a disadvantage that has been meted out to you, take it back to the Lord because it's a soul Babylonian operation. There's a lot of rage in the church. There's a lot of rage in our generation. We are on this tipping toe, this careful, delicate balance. If the young people get loosened for a moment, they can wreak havoc. Did we not see that during the NSAS? Or you think the NSAS guys, you know, they, they were the builders and the burners. You think the burners are not part of your generation? But you're not ready to reach them. We're happy to be in this AC space. Right? Hmm. Shala adults, let's just spend a moment to pray and I'm out of here. Thank you, Father. Let Kose Plando Sabaha. Shada Bahande Le Prekia So Trekerus. If you don't mind, can you rise and lift your hands and just say, Father, the workings of Christ. Mando so Kradiaste. You pray the way that the Holy Spirit causes you to pray. Please pray. The worship of God. The only true God, Makoto Palagados. We belong to Zion, Lekos, and we are Christ's. Lekos The workings of righteousness at Hebologodobahoste. Thank you, God. Sakande Lebash. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Just need to go on break now. All right. Just okay. Please let's celebrate Dr. K. Everybody get on your feet if you are not on your feet. You know, the Lord spoke to me yesterday. He said, This That there is a space being created now. There's, a, there's an emergence. Somebody say emergence. The Lord told me, he said, it's not coincidence that living faith is celebrating 40 years in this season. He said, there is a space that needs to be filled. And as many as are sensitive and aligned, it's a generational thing, 40 years. He said there is an emergence of a new generation. There will be releases of new sounds. New portals are opening up. And I heard the Lord saying, sensitive people, 
we fill in into these spaces. And he says, there will be people. He said, it's going to look like rising stars. But it's beyond rising stars. It's a movement of the spirits. I want you to lift up your two hands wherever you are. And join me in this prayer of consecration. Now, we're not asking you to do stuff by your strengths, by your capacity. We're asking you to just let God help you. Lift up your two hands. If you want to kneel down, you can kneel down. Just take a posture of consecration. I want you to say, Lord, I open up myself for whatever you will have me do in this season. There are going to be releases. There are going to be appointments. There are going to be ordinations. There are going to be discoveries. Heaven is going to be highlighting Esther's. People that were not known before, but they've been raised under the care of Mordecai for such a time as this. And those Esther's are going to be pushed into the palace. People are going to say they came from nowhere. But those said the Lord, they've been prepared through a season. And a season of their showing forth is now said the Lord. I will be pushing Esther's, Esther's to the corridors of power. Oh, this is serious. Can I have your attention, everybody? Everybody, can I? Those of you on your knees, get up, get up, get up. Can I have your attention? Can I speak freely? What I saw in the spirit is this. Esther's have been prepared. And they're going to be pushed into new spaces. They're going to be vastized. They're going to be moved out of the palaces. Listen, listen, listen. But the reason why the Esther's will be able to move in is because they've, they've been under the tutelage of Mordecai. And listen to me. And after the Esther's have moved into the palaces, they must stay connected to their Mordecai. Listen. The era of God has lifted me, I need a new mentor. Wow. Do you know if Esther had not listened to Mordecai, or if Mordecai was not in the life of Esther, Esther would have missed the purpose of her elevation. She was not elevated for herself. She would have misinterpreted God's purpose and turned it into self-preservation. She was ready to hide. But it took a Mordecai to let us see. You are not there for you. You are there for a divine purpose. And if you will not align, you will be replaced. So as God begins to lift you, don't push aside. The Mordecai is watching over you. There are people who say to the Lord that their calling is, is that of a Mordecai. He said they will not be prominent. They will not have 100,000 followers on social media. People will not know them in their city. But they are built for discipleship. He said, they will train, they will raise, they will build. He said, if you are going to be smart, he said, don't ever forget those people. Because when you move into the palace, in fact, the reason why you got into the palace for the first, in the first instance was because of them. And if you move into the palace and you have become so big now that they can't speak into your life because of your status in the palace, he said, you will soon discover that you are not there for you. You are there for a divine purpose. I see the body of Christ coming into a place of understanding by revelation that when God spotlights you, you won't get carried away. And you will not claim the credit. You will not tell the whole world your formula. Because that's what we've seen. People that were nobody that got raised, all of a sudden, they make it 
they made it as a, they, they, they made their success story a product of their methods. And now they want to hold seminars and tell people how I did it. But heaven spotlighted you for his own purpose. Why was it Joseph? Was it because he was so special among his brothers? It was heaven's spotlight. I know we're supposed to go on break, but I, I just need to do this, what I call prophetic interjection. And I'm going to be doing a lot of that in this conference. And I see a lot of conferences being held. I was telling Shola there, the Lord opened my eyes. And, and, I, and, I, and the Lord told me, say, I've given you a responsibility for a generation. A gathering where people will be taught, people will be informed, and people will get to know. Nekia Sotaba Kaya, Nekia Sotaba, Nene Sotaba, God's project for this season. Because there's a lot of time we are doing our projects and heaven does not know anything about it. But God said the Lord is changing. It's changing. There's a new generation arising. And my prayer for everybody under the sound of my voice is that you will find your place in that generation. You will not be missing. And one of the things we're going to, we're going to kick against is the spirit of competition. My tent is bigger than your tent. The Ilya Reviver was messed up by that. Everybody was trying to show off. Church growth is not for show off. By the way, is it your father's church? Is it not the church of Jesus? Wow. Okay, I'm not supposed to preach. But did you get the gist? Come on, did you get the gist? When we come back, it's going to be loaded.